subtle and profound. Let us underscore then, to counterbalance lightly Jean-Luc's emphasis. Jean-Luc um, suggests that in the image, the signification is undone. He's, he wants to emphasize very strongly the, 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 the dimension of the image that escapes signification. I think there's a slightly more subtle play of signification and um, uh, 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 an exploration of the limits of, of signification or sense. Um, I'm only shifting emphasis a little bit. Um, so let me underscore that there is a play of signification and reference that, that cannot be underestimated. In the culinary image, one never abandons the process of seeking reference. One seeks what one knows of the taste of a particular fish, for example, and one passes before one's mind the gamut of associations one can make with this dish, or that one cannot avoid making. At the same time, one appreciates what of taste exceeds signification. One is brought before a totality of sensations that demand a judgment of taste. This last is indissociable from a judgment on taste, and is thus already a form of thought as taste seeks its meaning. But let us not pass too quickly over the everyday sense of judgment, a judgment of taste, because El Bouilly proposes to its guests a singular challenge. By pushing the experimentation as far as it does, all, all the while returning a, retaining a strong reference to the languages of cuisine, it cannot avoid demanding a judgment as to whether the gesture has succeeded or not. In short, whether it's good or bad. In a, in a somewhat traditional sense of, of, uh, of taste in, in the context of cuisine. As I noted before, El Bouilly has not been recognized four times as the best restaurant in the world simply for its experimental excesses or its technological audacity. A response such as this is nice or this is interesting simply will not suffice. Before the totality of sense presented and simultaneously withdrawn, or the totality of sensation presented and simultaneously withdrawn by the image, one must judge. At the same time, El Bouilly forces the guest to bring their expectations into question and to rethink them in relation to everything at stake in El Bouilly's experimentation, particularly as concerns the role of technology in cuisine. One could say that it even re it forces us to rethink what taste can be. Now, Actually, I want to emphasize that last point. It, it, it forces us to rethink what taste can be. I think when one leaves, El, this was an um, experience of Edith and I, when we left El Bouilly, we said, oh, well, okay, that's it. Everything has changed. Um, there's no going back in relation to um, thinking about cuisine. Either we preserve this experience, again, I'm thinking in a Heideggerian sense, and, and move forward with it, or we just uh, make do with mom and pop um, for, the, you know, for the rest of our lives. Um, this was an event in the sense that it changed the criteria of, of taste, and, and it demanded that we start thinking about it. So that, that's, I guess, what I'm trying to do a little bit here. Okay. Now, let me emphasize once again that thus far we've approached only the isolated image of the individual dish. One must also recognize that the finite totality of meaning composed by the culinary image must be articulated with that of other images in the course of the meal. If one may recognize with Jean-Luc a rhythm in the composition of the image, um, a rhythm um, you know, in, in the play of traits, as he says, a rhythm, that, again, that is not only on two phases or two counts, as I said, following the two moments of the image, but which traverses each of these phases in and through the play of differential traits, whereas the, wherein the image is excribed, as Nasi says, there is also the rhythm that is constitute, constituted in the succession of images. For the images are conjoined in a totality that deconstructs and recomposes the classical meal in such a way as to transform profoundly the time of the meal. Briat Savarin recognized in cuisine a singular lightening of the burden of existence. The table, he said, is the only place where one is not bored in the first hour. The series of culinary surprises composed by Ferran Adria carries the one who gives themselves over to it for a period of no less than four hours, without fatigue and without surfeit. But it is not simply the constantly renewed élan, or surprise, or transport that creates this, this effect. It is due more fundamentally to the rhythm of the experience. Thus. In the meal, there is a kind of distension of the present of intensity, as Nancy says, um, and, and that he discovers in the immobility of the visual image just as much as what he calls the immobility of the temporal stretches involved in music, 
uh, choreography or cinema, where succession becomes a form of simultaneity. There is, as he says, a same time in this experience, which is created by rhythm. Now, in evoking the motif of rhythm in this way, I rejoin Jean-Luc, who rejoins Heidegger in thinking rhythm from a notion of articulation and the composition of traits. If time permitted, I would pursue the reference further by seeking to articulate together the rhythm of presentations with the rhythm of the form of mitzain that takes place in hospitality and conviviality. I recall here that Heidegger, in the epoch of the existential analytic, thought the ground of being together from a temporal schematism that he described as rhythmic. So, the rhythm of the meal that is established in the very ground of the image, as, as uh, Nancy would put it, must be thought from the sharing of a sense that occurs in and through what Ria Savarin tried to call le convivia, the conviviality, and as this unfolds throughout the extension of the meal. But how might one then describe the completion uh, or end of the meal, its perfection? And here I'm picking up um, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's reflection on the end of art um, in an essay called uh, Vestige. Um, and I'm taking up the question of entelechy um, that, that uh, Greg touched last night. This is not a simple question. However, it happens that in 2003, El Bouilly marked this accomplishment of the meal with the arrival of a full loaf of bread served on a wooden board. This is a perfect example of the figural gesture at El Bouilly. Here we had fundamental reference to the very idea of the meal and the symbol of communion, arriving, however, at the end of the meal and as dessert. And it was not to be eaten, as we were informed, until the one officiating, but there was no right here, I'm talking about the waiter, had broken it, broken the bread, in order to reveal that this basic symbol of hospitality was in fact hollow. He, he put the bread on, down on the table I forget what he used, a little hammer, I think it was just and the thing shattered, right? So the, 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 you know, of course we think of the breaking of bread as the symbol of communion. Well, he offered us the bread and smashed it at the end and, and then we ate them, the morsels, and they were actually delicious. So at the heart of the broken bread was nothing. It is at this moment that the experience of the meal, I think, begins to present itself in its gathered totality. The breaking of the bread provokes a reflective turn that has been prepared throughout the meal. It is, no longer a simply, it is no longer simply a question, it never has been, of a simple judgment of taste. One is obliged to pose the question of the meaning of the experience. In fact, there will have been, throughout the meal, the stimulation of what Adria calls in his manner, after many others, including Bria Savard himself, a sixth sense. Adria defines the sixth sense as an intellectual stimulation that takes form in the setting into movement of all the senses and also in a supplementary movement that derives from the creative exchange that takes place when the guest undertakes, let's just call it the hermeneutics of his or her experience, bringing to this interpretive act not only memory and intelligence, but also imagination in order to make something of the poetic propositions and the rhythmic passage that they have traversed. This intellectual game is not without its analytic and conceptual reflection, which will be pursued well after the meal. What has the cuisine become here? Where is it going? One is almost driven to write, and one in fact sees people um, taking notes constantly at Albuya. This is a, a curious phenomenon. At the tables, people <laughs> cut pencils and paper out constantly. Um, because there's an entire science of cuisine and nutrition mobilized here in a creative fashion. But once reflection touches upon the relation between technology and nature, and here I'm coming to my end, once, once reflection touches upon this relation between technology and nature, one senses that Adria is quite justified in using the word thought for what he has sought to provoke. Because the guest's hermeneutics now knows itself to be confronting and becoming what Jean-Luc calls a technics of the ground, without ground. And, and technique du fond, sans fond, which, he, which is a technics of the sense of the world. And it becomes, or in fact it already has become, this reflection has become conscious of this from the basis of the extreme creative play that is celebrated at El Bouilly. El Bouilly, in some sense, foregrounds a crea creativity that remarks itself in all great art, as Heidegger says, through the play of distinction itself. 
Moreover, this creativity offers itself as a groundless technique of the ground in a figure such as the broken bread. And there are many other such figures in, in, other, uh, in this humor that he, that he employs. So, in sum, it is existence as a technique du fond that is touched in the experience at El Bouilly and that discovers itself in and through the singular pleasure that one might translate in saying that, in fact, here, one is happy to recognize that one is what one eats, according to one of Briar Savarin's famous maxims. It is a matter of almost nothing. I recall Barthes' remark when he says the cuisine implies a philosophy of the nothing. But from the vestige that remains and that one is called to preserve, there opens the possibility of a preparatory thought for a cuisine to come, and there also opens a form of waiting. Thought therefore knows a kind of very agreeable hunger. But I'll defer to another occasion this question of the hunger of thought. Thank you.